Welcome to another episode of Things We Said Today, a podcast about the Beatles, everything about the Beatles and anything about the Beatles, both together and solo. That's what Things We Said Today is all about. And I'm Darren DeVivo, one of the three hosts of Things We Said Today. I'm from WFUV Radio in New York City uh, at 90.7 FM, also 90.7 FM HD2. And you can listen to WFUV anywhere at WFUV.org. Download our app. You can even ask your smart speaker to play WFUV in New York City. And I've been part of WFUV since 1984. And uh, it is a thrill to get to hang out with you every other week and talk Beatles together and solo, not only with you, but with my friends, Ken Michaels and Alan Cozen. Now, before I introduce Ken, Alan Cozen's not with us tonight. Uh, and he's not going to be part of uh, some of the upcoming shows because, as you may or may not know, Alan is working on what sounds like it's going to be the definitive history slash biography of Paul McCartney. And part one it is due to the publisher in a little over a month. And Alan's working hard uh, to meet his deadlines as he puts together this book, uh, which he's actually co-writing. So Alan is taking a bit of a break concentrating on his upcoming McCartney book. And if he still has uh, his marbles intact, uh, once he submits, uh, you know, meets his deadline and submits the book, he'll be back with us, hopefully, chatting here on Things We Said Today. Ken Michaels is here, though, and there wouldn't be a Things We Said Today without Ken. Ken's been doing uh, Beatles radio programs for very close to 40 years now. He's hosted well over 2,000 Beatle-oriented shows many years ago. He was on WDHA, spent some time uh, on XM Radio. These days, under normal circumstances, his radio show, Every Little Thing, would be heard live every Wednesday night at 8 on WNHU, which is located in a town I always forget, in Connecticut. (laughs) It's West Haven. West Haven. See, it moves around every week. I always think it's Bridgeport. But anyway, uh, but because of the pandemic, WNHU's operations have have ground to a halt, but Ken also does an Every Little Thing, which is a syndicated version of that show, which is uh, readily available. And Ken, if you don't mind jumping in, tell us uh, about listening to Every Little Thing, the syndicated program. Well, yeah, there are over 40 stations that carry the show. And if you go to my website, which is kenmichaelsradio.com, there's a page that is dedicated to just the syndicated version. It tells you all the radio stations that carry it, uh, what time the show airs. It has links to their websites so you can stream them. It also lists if they're on other platforms like uh, Alexa, uh, for example. So, uh, yeah, just go to the website, kenmichaelsradio.com, and you can listen to that show. And by the way, um, unlike other syndicated shows where a new show gets produced and all the stations play the same show, all my stations have access to all my shows, and they have total freedom to run any one they want to. So you can be hearing different shows on different stations. And there's not one day of the week when my show isn't airing somewhere. So, yeah, uh, just check it out at the, at, radio, at, uh, at the website. And there are actually some of these broadcasting outlets who will air multiple shows at the same time. That's true. Um, and get confusing. It actually sounds like an early Yoko Ono album, then hosted by Ken Michaels. Anyway, uh, just joking, just joking. I love Yoko. It's a joke. All right. Uh, also have to make mention of the fact that Ken's also part of another video cast called Talk More Talk. It's Ken, it's Kid O'Toole, it's Tom Hunyadi. You have a new fourth host now, correct? Fairly. Joe Mayo. Yep, Joe, Joe Mayo. And uh, he's been known for many years as Mean Mr. Mayo. Right. And uh, Ken Womack uh, has been returning to our show. He was original, oh. yeah, an original co-host. He's come back every now and then. He has to attend to uh, work at the college where he's a dean in New Jersey at Monmouth College. And sometimes he's taken away from the show. But he's there most of the time now on our show. So you will see five co-hosts on the screen uh, when you watch Talk More Talk. And that makes for fun, like if you're watching the show, I've done this before, you can like uh, play target practice and throw things at the five hosts and see who gets hit the most. 
Um, we have stats for that. Most people throw them at me. <laughs> so Ken Michaels, I'm Darren DeVivo, Alan Cozen taking a break this week and for the next few shows uh, here on Things We Said Today. Uh, so before we jump into our topic for this week, Ken Michaels has rounded up some Beatle news for us. Ken? Well, actually, before we do that, I just want to let our listeners know that for the next two shows that we'll be doing, we're oh, actually yeah. going to be we're going to be joining forces with another uh, podcast show called Two Legs, which is a solo Paul McCartney podcast. And Tom Hunyadi is one of the co-hosts of that show, and he's also my co-host in Talk More Talk. And he has a new co-host on that show. Uh, named Annie Nichols, and that's a video podcast, uh, Two Legs, but it's also on many other platforms. So we're going to be doing two shows with those two guys, the next two shows after this. And the next show is going to be a Things We Said Today broadcast, just like this one. You can listen to it on Podbean, iTunes, and YouTube. And then the following show, we're going to be on their show on Two Legs. So you'll actually be able to watch us on screen, which could what? be a dangerous thing. What? But, uh, on screen? <laughs> that's right. Okay. Um, but anyway, Two Legs, for those of you that aren't familiar with it, it's all about Paul McCartney's solo career. And uh, Tom Hunyadi and Andy Nichols are the co-hosts, and they tackle a lot of different subjects. So that show that we'll be doing with them will be on a solo McCartney topic and that show is also heard on podbean itunes and youtube but also on lots of other platforms like spotify uh, iheart radio it's uh, also an apple podcast as well so just to uh give you guys a heads up on that we will be doing shows with them and uh you know we'll be uh thinking of linking the two shows together thinking of linking nice wasn't and that we clever? Have, <laughs> we have actually, between the three of us, me, Ken, and, and Alan Cozen, we have talked about turning uh, things we said today possibly into a video cast. So uh, it'll be a little bit of an experiment, I guess, for us. And we'll try to figure out after the fact, after we maybe do you and I do the show uh, as guests on two legs, we'll try to figure out how many people were actually frightened by seeing us. <laughs> and if the number is manageable, we may just make things we said today a video cast. But that's for another time in another place. Well, I was breaking them in so they could see me on Talk More Talk. <laughs> I should so actually, a... I should be on that show and, and when it begins, have a bag over my head. <laughs> I got to remember that. OK, anyway, news time, Ken. OK, we have a ton of news because actually we weren't uh, we did not have a new show last week. We got three weeks of news. And uh, a lot concerning uh, charity records that are out, major passings. But uh, we'll start by letting you know that in continuing with more bonus material to come from the Flaming Pie box set, Paul has made available on his website a free download for the song Calico Skies, which was actually taken from the In the World Tonight campfire scene. And actually, if you are familiar with that documentary, which is part of the Flaming Pie box set that we're about to discuss here on this show, it's a little bit different because in the documentary, it flip flops between the campfire scene to the studio with Paul and Linda, back to the campfire, back to the studio. But this version is strictly all from the campfire. OK, and there was an instrumental version of the song Broomstick. That was made available on Rolling Stone magazine. That's one of the bonus tracks from Flaming Pie that Paul worked on with Steve Miller. Also, there was a new video for the song Little Willow that premiered on YouTube. That was on August the 7th at noon. It was just an event premiering at that time. It's also available on the box set as well. You can find a brand new and excellent interview with Paul and the new September issue of British GQ with photography from Mary McCartney. It is a very candid interview in which Paul revealed that he has used his time during the COVID-19 crisis to write and record new songs. He told GQ what he's been doing while isolated. He said, I've been able to write and get into music, starting songs, finishing songs. I like having stuff to do as it keeps the brain busy. And on top of all my projects, I've had the luxury of just being able to sit down and write songs for no reason, which is great. It keeps me off the streets. End of <laughs> quote. 
So I've been excited about hearing that. That's the best news in this entire article. I'm already imagining McCartney 3 coming out of this. When asked if he would consider playing Las Vegas like Elton John, Paul said, that's where you go to die. And nothing yeah. attracts him. Nothing attracts him about the idea of playing there. Really worthwhile interview, if you can catch it. Uh, very candid interview from Paul. And uh, also, concerning Flaming Pie, it did make it to number 14 on the official album charts in the UK, and then it completely dropped off. And it re-entered the U.S. Billboard Top 200 album charts at number 74. Wow. And I, I would expect it to drop off quickly, too, because all the fans that want it get it quickly in the first week or two. And then there's very little interest after that. So it's really the most loyal fans that are aware, about, uh, aware of it that go out and buy it immediately. And then it drops off the charts. But it's nice to see any showing uh, for Flaming Pie or any archival album. Uh, I also heard that last Friday, August the 14th, Spotify had a listening party for Flaming Pie. Now, this past Saturday, August the 15th, Ringo Starr and his all-star band, as well as Sean Lennon, participated in another virtual charity concert. This one was called D-Tour, D-E hyphen tour. It streamed starting at 1 p.m. and it went on for most of the day. And the aim of this charity is to provide money for musicians who have been severely affected through tour cancellations from COVID-19. And also for these same musicians and artists who, like many people, don't know when the work will return. This applies to everybody. All the roadies, all the technical people that you need for these tours, they're all affected by this. It was presented by the Morrison Gallery Hotel. Donations are voluntary, but Spotify matches all the donations dollar for dollar. Ringo submitted a video of his current all-star band doing Yellow Submarine. And Sean, along with his girlfriend, Charlotte Kemp Mule, part of uh, Ghost of a Sabertooth Tiger, they actually submitted three videos. One of them was called Jardine du Luxembourg. There was also a performance of the Beatle classic Come Together, uh, which is now available on YouTube from a band made up of Lizzie Hale, Slash, Gilby Clark, Linda Perry, Blasco, Mark Garson, and Matt Sorum. Other acts that performed included Train, Jesse Mallon, Bare Naked Ladies, Ray Parker Jr. <laughs> he did Ghostbusters for this. Uh, yeah. Melvin Taylor, uh, Cheap Trick, John Oates as well. If you are interested, you can donate to this charity. You can text DETOUR. 707070. Now, something that we just found out about right before we were about to record this show, Darren found out, is something that is very similar in concept for helping musicians out. Darren, you want to let our yeah. listeners know? Yeah, this is something that uh, Dark Horse Records is involved in. And you mentioned Jesse Mallon in the event that just took place last weekend. Jesse Mallon uh, is one of the producers of. Uh, a live thing that's going to take place this coming Friday afternoon, August 21st. Many of you probably listening to this show, uh, it will have passed. So I'll tell you how you could possibly uh, check it out after the fact. This is called, um, well, it's Gates of the West and Dark Horse Records getting together to present a song for Joe celebrating the life of Joe Strummer, a benefit for Save Our Stages uh, which is uh, similar to what Ken was just talking about. Save Our Stages is uh, a charity trying to basically um, help independent live music venues and promoters across the United States. Now, this Joe Strummer tribute has got one heck of a uh, guest list of performers. Albert Hammond Jr. of The Strokes, Beto O'Rourke, Bob Gruen, Bob Weir, Brian Fallon used to be in the Gaslight Anthem, Bruce Springsteen, Butch Walker, Craig Finn, and Tad Kubler of The Hold Steady, Danny Harrison, The Dropkick Murphys, uh, Frank Turner, Hines, uh, there's Jesse Mallon, he'll be performing, Jim Jarmish, Joe Ely, the great Joe Ely, Josh Homme from Queens of the Stone Age, Lucinda Williams, Matt Dillon, also Steve Buscemi, Tom Morello, and more. And there will be uh, 
uh, never, before, never before seen footage of Joe Strummer performing live. This is going to be streaming live Friday, August 21st at 3 o'clock Eastern time. For more information and perhaps to catch it after the fact, go to joestrummer.com. Very good. You know, uh, what can you say? We're all hurting at this time. So many people are hurting financially, and it's nice to see all these virtual concerts happening still. And they seem to be getting better and better in terms of uh, technically getting better. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, all these all these fine musicians all reaching out, trying to help each other. And, um, you know, it really is very, very nice to see us, uh, you know, helping out each other in times of, of uh, trouble and need like today. Right. Last last Friday on August the 14th, a brand new cover version of George Harrison's song Be Here Now was released by Doyle Bramhall II with Susan Tedeschi and Derek Trucks. It's part of a compilation to benefit Turn Up the Recovery. This is an organization practicing abstinence, abstinence based recovery through music. You can find a video for the song under Doyle Bram Hall II. And you can also make a donation at turnupforthecovery.org/slash donate. All the proceeds will go to Turn Up for Recovery and their ongoing efforts to help provide those in need with treatment at Crossroads Center Antigua, which provides medical, physical, and psychological support in a safe environment. And I love the fact that they used Be Here Now uh, as a song for this particular cause. Really is a, a gorgeous song, stunning song, with a powerful message from George. Nice to see it being recognized and really well performed here. Mm-hmm. It is a great performance. And finally, as far as... Um, a charity record is concerned. Our good friend and colleague Jeff Slate has just released a double CD called Lockdown Live. Jeff is a New York musician who has played with various members of Wings and Elephant's Memory, put out a lot of original music, and is also a journalist writing articles for publications like NBC, Rolling Stone, and for Tidal. You might recognize his name for writing liner notes for the Beatles' 50th anniversary box set for Sgt. Pepper. He's also played at the Fest for Beatles fans. When COVID-19 hit, like a lot of musicians, he performed virtual concerts. And he did so from his apartment in New York City. And starting April the 4th, it was every Thursday afternoon. And he recorded all of his shows. And he picked two discs of his best performances to put out, 43 songs in total, which include nine original songs, plus covers of George Harrison music, Neil Young, Elvis Costello, Bob Dylan, Tom Petty, and others. From George, he covered Give Me Love, This Is Love, and The Traveling Wilbury is Handled With Care. And Jeff Slate is donating 100% of the proceeds from the sales of his merchandise to Meals of Gratitude, Black Lives Matter, the North Star Fund, Justice for Julius, the Black Artist Fund, and others, while covering the shipping costs out of his own pocket. To know more about Jeff and to buy his release, you can go to his website, which is Jeff Slate, S-L-A-T-E-H-Q.com. There you go. Right. Very nice of Jeff to be doing all this. He puts on great shows, so if you can, Thursday afternoons, try to catch them. The Beatles have the cover story on the October issue of Mojo Magazine on their album, Rubber Soul, calling the album their first masterpiece. And the cover story in the latest issue of Rolling Stone has the Beatles on the front cover, and it covers all the details behind their breakup. Really good article right there. Some very upsetting news here that the mayor of Liverpool, Joe Anderson, is saying that uh, the city may be forced to close down the famous Cavern Club because of poor sales due to the coronavirus. The club made famous by the Beatles has been losing 30,000 pounds a week since the beginning of the pandemic. The club has been preparing to reopen, but can only do so at a 30 percent capacity. Those in charge say the Cavern is facing financial ruin if they don't receive help from the government soon. Let's hope uh, they can get some kind of relief because that's such a historic site right there. I know there's a petition floating around which I signed to save the cavern. Um, so maybe the Google cavern petition might find that. Okay, I'll have to do that. All right, some major passings that we have to bring up. 
one of which is of the Abbey Road engineer, Eddie Klein. Eddie worked as a technical engineer at Abbey Road Studios in the 60s, then left to work at Apple Studios at Savile Row, then came back to Abbey Road in 1974, and followed that with working with Paul in the early 80s and until recently. In fact, he's in the credits on the Flaming Pie box set. Prior to working with Paul, Eddie Klein was one of the engineers for George Harrison's All Things Must Pass album. His name is in the credits for John's Imagine album, where after his name it reads in parentheses, no relations, meaning not related to Alan Klein. A uh, quote from Paul, he says, this is really nice. People often say words cannot express, etc., and that is how I feel about Eddie. There were so many sides to his character that it seems impossible to mention all of them. He was a loving man with a twinkling sense of humor and a love of good music, we would hug when we met, and he would sometimes bow slightly and call me my liege. We'd go back many years, and my first memories were in the studios and corridors of Abbey Road, where he worked. We were the crazy artists experimenting with techniques, and Eddie and his mates were the engineers who had to make it happen. When he put my recording studio together, it was done with great expertise, and I think the only person who knew what every fader and knob did was Eddie. When we talk music, as we often did, he would often sing in his rich baritone voice to remind me of the melody most people would have forgotten. I love him for his wit, his skills, and his loyalty. I will always remember him and all the things we did together with great fondness. What a great man, but as I said at the beginning, words cannot express. Love you, Ed, from Paul. Rather lengthy there from Paul McCartney, but uh, definitely a big loss in his life. He was with Paul for quite a while. I do believe that he built the studio for Paul around the time of McCartney too. I think that's what uh, Paul was referring to there. Mm. Another person connected to the Beatles, singer Trini Lopez, passed away. He was born in Dallas to Mexican immigrants. His music mixed American folk with Latin and rockabilly music, and he is best known for scoring several big hits in the 60s, like Pete Seeger's If I Had a Hammer, also covered by Peter, Paul, and Mary, and Lemon Tree, which was also covered by Peter, Paul, and Mary. Trini's connection to the Beatles is that from January 16th to February 4th, 1964, he was on the same bill with the Beatles at the Olympia Theater in Paris, also with French singer Sylvie Vartan. Perhaps most significant, Trini was the headlining act. The Beatles opened for him. Those three acts performed two shows a night for the week and three shows for the weekend. In an interview with ClassicBands.com, Trini said he used to steal the show every night. And French newspapers would say, who are the Beatles? According to Trini, the Beatles didn't have much of an act. They used to just stand there and shake their heads with their hair. Trini also told reporters he didn't think the group would go over well in America. And there was a band there that he liked better, called the Beach Boys. But it was during their stay in Paris when the group learned that their single, I Want to Hold Your Hand, had made number one in the United States. And after that, as everyone knows, everything changed. The Beatles didn't have to open for anybody. Trini Lopez continued to perform all these many years later. He was 83 when he died on August the 12th, the victim of the coronavirus. Mm -hmm. Very, another very sad uh, bit of news. Yeah, a lot of young people may not be aware of his connection there to the Beatles at a very important time mm -hmm. in their history. Also, we learned just a few days ago, Sean O'Mahony has died. He was the publisher and the owner of Beatles Monthly magazine and record collector. For Beatles Monthly, he went under the name of Johnny Dean. The magazine ran from 1963 through 1969 and was revived in 1976, reprinting each of the originals but with several new pages of information added and then continuing beyond that with more new material up to issue 321. He also was the owner of the stage show for Greece. Very sad to hear that. And I know that for all the years that I've been doing Beatles shows and Beatle News has been such a big part of it, Beatles Monthly was a primary source for me for Beatle News, along with Beatle Fan and Good Day Sunshine and lots of uh, Beatles fanzines. But uh, I always loved picking up Beatles Monthly 
And so uh, more sad news right there. Another big part of Beale history. Sean O'Mahony has died. I do believe that uh, Mark Lewis and the early part of his career, he was working for Beatles Monthly and working with Sean. Hmm. We've got quite a bit more news, and I think you'll be excited because there's a lot of really worthwhile stuff here to talk about. According to the Liverpool Echo, the University of Liverpool will name its new teaching and performance facility the Yoko Ono Lennon Centre. Work is underway for the centre, which is expected to open late next year, costing £22 million. The new facility will house the Tongue Auditorium, a 400-seat state-of-the-art performance space, and the Paul Brett Lecture Theatre, the largest purpose-built lecture space on campus. This is all part of a significant step towards realizing a dream of providing for the Liverpool City region. Very happy to see Yoko Ono recognized for so much support that she has given to the city of Liverpool. A few shows back, I mentioned that PBS television was airing a documentary on the life of film star Mae West called Dirty Blonde, which has Ringo Starr making an appearance in it. Ringo was in Mae's last film of her career called Sextet, which also featured the recently departed Regis Philbin. This documentary was just released on DVD on August the 11th. Okay, more news. Joey Milan from Badfinger has announced that his new album is done. I checked, and it's listed on Amazon as an October 16th release called Be True to Yourself on Omnivore Records, the same company that put out the recent Harry Nilsson album, Lost and Found. It includes appearances from Julian Lennon, Mickey Dolenz, Jason Sheff, and Steve Holly. Notice, by the way, that Mickey Dolenz and Jason Sheff are on there, and they perform with Joey on that recent tribute to the White Album on that tour. The album has 10 new songs from Joey on it. We look forward to hearing that. There is a video, uh, like trailer. Have you seen it? Yeah, I've been sharing it on Facebook. I mean, the sound, the songs, I think it's two songs that kind of get blended together sound really good yeah i think so it does have a mark hudson feel to it uh-huh. so uh and mark hudson uh did some of the writing and co-produced the album for joey right. another new book on john lennon is due out in september called the complete john lennon songs all the songs all the stories all the lyrics 1970 to 1980 by paul denoyer it's a track by track analysis of the stories behind each song that john wrote in his solo career paul has also done similar books on bob dylan and neil young it's being published by weldon owen and it's due out september 29th jerry hammock's detailed works on the recording process behind the beatles music so far released in four volumes will have its final volume coming out in november with the title this is the title of the series the beatles recording reference manual it's an amazing look how the Beatles recorded their songs, including the dates for each song, what each Beatle played, the model instruments and even amplifiers, if it's known, and how each instrument was placed in the mix. Okay, so uh, the last of the series coming out in November. As we mentioned on our last show, there was a special on AXS TV of Nuno Betancourt and Friends. Nuno is known for being a guitarist in the band Extreme, and one of his guests on the show was Julian Lennon. The two of them together perform Radiohead song Karma Police, and if you haven't seen it, you can check it out on YouTube. Really fine performance of just the two of them and uh, Julian in fine voice for the Radiohead mm. song. I love that song. Mm-hmm. Gotta check that out. Another new book is coming out, this one on February 9th. That's an important date. February 9th, 2021, called The Beatles 100, 100 Pivotal Moments in Beatle History by John Borak, whose name you might be familiar with as he's a contributing editor for Goldmine Magazine. He's also the author of Shakes Some Action, The Ultimate Power Pop Guide, released in 2008. Also, John Lennon, Life is What Happens, that came out in 2010 and Shake Some Action 2.0, a guide to the 200 greatest power pop albums from 1970 to 2017. John's new book tackles such questions such as, was John Lennon meeting Paul McCartney more significant than John meeting Yoko Ono? 
Rubber Soul or Revolver? Which Wings album was Paul McCartney's solo pinnacle? The book will be released on Rare Bird Books. You can pre-order the book at this website, rarebirdlit.com. That's rarebirdlit.com. Terry Crane's recent book, NEMS and the Business of Selling Beatles Merchandise in the U.S., 1964 to 1966, is being released in a second edition with over 700 images, mostly in color, in the book. And with 12 new pages to the now 250-page book, it's now updated and edited to give you the most up-to-date information. The book is now available through Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and the tradition.com website. And I failed to mention this before. One last uh, important passing to note, that being of Wayne Fontana, who along <laughs> with his group, the Mindbenders, they were part of the British invasion, scoring a number one hit in 1965 with Game of Love. The Mindbenders were uh, part of a lineup of artists that performed at the NME Pole Winners Concert in 1965, along with the Beatles, Rolling Stones, Kinks, Animals, Donovan, Moody Blues, Herman's Hermits, and others. The other major connection between the Mindbenders and a Beatle was one of the members of the Mindbenders was Eric Stewart, who went on to be in 10CC and also worked with Paul McCartney for his albums Tug of War through Press to Play. Wayne Fontana died from cancer, and he was 74. I also just realized, thinking back to this NME concert, at the concert you had both Wayne Fontana and the Mindbenders and the Moody Blues. The Moody Blues with Denny Lane in it. Mm. So it's kind of ironic at that one show, you had two musicians that would later be key figures in Paul McCartney's post-Beatles career. Mm. And that's all the Beatle news I have. That's it? <laughs> that's three weeks worth there, Darren. Oh, wow. Could, couldn't come up with more. No, I'm sorry. Uh, I've been kind of lazy lately. Yeah, all right. Well, uh, there you have it. The news, folks, here on Things We Said Today. And from the news, we turn to Flaming Pie. And that's the topic of today's edition of Things We Said Today, the brand new Paul McCartney Deluxe Box Set Reissue Archive Collection Entry, Flaming Pie. Paul's 1997 album, uh, now available as what I believe, if I've counted correctly, is the 13th installment of uh, in Paul McCartney's Archive Collection. Uh, Flaming Pie really getting the super deluxe attention with this brand new set, and uh, which we'll talk about, comes in many different configurations. They all do, all of these box sets do. Flaming Pie is, he thinks quickly, uh, without notes in front of him, is the most recent McCartney album to be expanded and reissued in this archive collection. Most recent being that it came out uh, a little over 20 years ago, 23 to be exact, in 1997, coming out on uh, the heels of the Beatles anthology project, the albums, the documentary, and Jeff Lynne involved in Flaming Pie. Jeff Lynne was involved in the new Beatles song for the anthology. So that all ties together, mid-1990s period. And uh, I know I can speak for Ken in this case, and I can speak for a lot of McCartney fans. Flaming Pie is, as, as probably many of you listening right now may agree with me, Flaming Pie is amongst McCartney's finest albums, and definitely an album that ranks amongst his top 10. Sometimes when I'm putting a list together of my favorite McCartney albums, it'll drift into my top five, even. From my personal tastes, I thought it was the best McCartney record in a very long time. I ultimately liked it more than Flowers in the Dirt and Press to Play, two albums which I thought very highly of. And uh, maybe going back to uh, the Wings period, uh, Flaming Pie uh, knocked me out that much that I was like, you know what? It, the late period album is amongst the best that this former Beatle has done. And, and I think uh, uh, for the most part, you'd agree with me because I know you think very highly of Flaming Pie. Yeah, I do. I mean, McCartney has now released a few, if you include his Wings albums, the Fireman, the classical music. There's over 30 albums in his post-Beatles career now, and I would definitely rank Flaming Pie in the top 10. 
Uh, my top three has been pretty consistent through the years, but everything else, uh, what I place in my top 10 can move around a bit. But I definitely think quite highly of it song for song. It's one of his most solid albums for sure. Right. I just, I just, just to backtrack a little bit, I mentioned it was the, this is the 13th box set and it is, but if you count the Red Rose Speedway wildlife combo box set that I never got my hands on and I'm still aggravated about that. If you count, (laughs) if you count that separately, that's 14 box sets. Uh, So I kind of did kind of gloss over that. If I pretend it doesn't exist, I won't feel as bad about not having it. But uh, as for individual albums getting the expanded treatment, Flaming Pie is number 13. Uh, the album coming out May 97, and now here at the end of July, now we're at August 2020, the deluxe edition. So, go ahead. I don't, uh, I don't know how you figured the 13 or 14. I just know that there were various times when Paul released two box sets at the same time. Like you just said, Wildlife and Red Rose Speedway. He also right. put out Tug of War and Pipes of Peace at the same time. He also there- put out uh, Venus and Mars and Wings at the Speed of Sound at the same time. But they were individual box sets released at the same time. Just that one time, Red Rose Speedway and Wildlife were combined in that mega box set that was available for about an hour and a half. Um, (laughs) uh, So, yeah, the list is here. The Band on the Run in 2010. So we're coming up on the 10-year anniversary this November of this series of reissues. McCartney and McCartney 2 simultaneously June 2011. Uh, Ram in uh, may 2012 and then we had uh, wings over america may 2013 venus and mars wings at the speed of sound in september 2014 together tug of war pipes of peace together october 2015 flowers in the dirt march 2017 red rose speedway wildlife and the mega box set december 2018 and now in july 2020 flaming pie so 14 box sets, 13 albums, and we continue on. What is some of the qualities uh, of Flaming Pie that appeal to you most, Ken, and make it an album that you comfortably put within your list of favorite McCartney albums? Well, to me, it's a very simple statement to make, and I might say it a little bit too much in all the work that I do, but everything comes down to the songs first for me. Production's important, but it's nowhere near as important as the songs. And, um, you know, there are certain songs on Flaming Pie, like uh, Some Days, which I think is one of his greatest love songs ever, and Calico Skies and Beautiful Night. Those are three really great love songs, all on one album. Three of the best of his entire career, I believe. All the songs on this album, with the exception of Really Love You, I consider it to be very strong songs, very melodic. I like the sound of his voice. I like the whole arrangements of his songs. Um, song per song, they're really great. The World Tonight has always been one of my favorite of McCartney's songs. It's a really mm-hmm. good rocker, which I wish he would do live. He's never done it live before. you know. And um, in this particular case, I know that there are a lot of fans out there that would prefer that McCartney's songs or McCartney's albums would be produced more like Flaming Pie. A very simple production, not overproduced, not slick. If it takes Paul to play all or most of the instruments, that's fine. But a lot of fans tend to prefer the sound that Paul had production-wise on uh, Beatles albums and his albums of the 70s, where basically uh, on the 70s albums, he was the main producer on almost all of them with the rare exception of George Martin or uh, Chris Thomas co-producing Back to the Egg. They like that more pure, natural, organic sound of Paul. There are even fans that I know of that like Paul's production and his albums pre-Band on the Run. (laughs) You know, maybe once uh, he really hit it big with Band on the Run, there was a certain wing sound that fans, there are some fans that like the even earlier sounds. You know, wildlife is as bare and raw as you can get. And some people really prefer that, Mm -hmm. you know, even more so than than Ben on the Run, Venus and Mars on. But um, there are fans out there that prefer the sound of production wise, a flaming pie or a chaos and creation in the backyard 
more so than the slickness of a flowers in the dirt pressed to play or even the George Martin produced tug of war pipes of peace Broad Street period. So I think once you combine the quality of the songs with a more simpler production, I think that that appeals to a lot of fans. And we are living in a time, because I I believe that the music industry is very trendy. And we're living in a time when when I think that a lot of fans want that simpler production. They like hearing songs that are strictly a band. You know, not too much extra instrumentation orchestration whatever you want to however you want to word it when it's very simple when it's bare when it's raw i think a lot of fans like that a lot now not that they don't like the way it was before but they find it really fascinating and i think you know and i say this about beatles music i say it about solo music when you strip songs down to just their barest elements when you just hear a demo of a song and you love it as a demo it tells you how strong the song was to begin with, without mm-hmm. even a band arrangement. And I found right. that to be a lot with Beatles music and a lot of their solo music. Right. So um, I think fans are appreciating more this style of, the, of production today. Could be different later on, could be different 10 years from now. But I think that there, people, fans are hearkening back to this earlier sound, and they're preferring it more. It's more real. You know, they right. like the rawness of it. They like the pureness of it. I always remember it, even though this is about another album, a friend of mine, when Chaos and Creation in the Backyard came out, he came over to our house, big McCartney fan, slammed the CD on the table and said, this is what I want McCartney to sound like. It's like the first McCartney album. Mm-hmm. Now, me being the type of person who wants an artist to explore and be as creative as possible and try different things and experiment i don't want artists to always go back and do something that they did already but there are fans out there that prefer when paul has a sound like this right you know i've got fans that listen to my show where there's nothing like the early mccartney stuff especially the acoustic stuff heart of the country mama's little girl some people never know every night those those type of songs which really would have fit on the white album you know mccartney's acoustic stuff on the white album there are fans that love that that devour that sound of paul and flaming pie is is closer to that so much more so than flowers in the dirt was or off the ground or or uh you know certainly pressed to play so i think that's part of the appeal in this day and age for flaming pie but for me personally the songs always come first, and the songs on this album, with the exception of one, are super. I really love every song on Flaming Pie, uh, except Really Love You. But I still like it because I know it's Paul and Ringo, and they're jamming together, and it's spontaneous. And some people like that, too. Yeah, I, that's, that's kind of like where I'm going to go with my thoughts on the original album uh, and how I look at it in his catalog and thought of it when it first came out. I love that kind of like, a raw jammy kind of thing that's happening on really love you. And, you know, it's the kind of thing that you could strip everything away and just let me listen to Ringo's drumming and that would be fine. Mm. Um, But uh, yeah, I, um, my thoughts on all of that basically were when flaming pie came out, it knocked me out. It it immediately, I immediately connected with it and have always looked at the album as sort of being a McCartney sampler it has a little of everything that we've loved about Paul. Do you like the ballads? Well, you pointed this out already, Ken. You like the ballads? Well, you got, um, you've got Little Willow. You've got Calico Skies. You've got Some Days, songs that harken back to things like I Will and Mother Nature's Son. If you like uh, more of a rocking Paul, uh, you got things like The World Tonight. If you like production, you've got Great uh, Beautiful Night. If you like Strip Bear, there's Great Day. Not a stripped bear, but a song that's stripped bear. There's great, <laughs> there's great day collaborations. Yep, they're here. Steve Miller's on used to be bad. We mentioned Ringo appears on a couple of things. Uh, Paul Sun plays guitar on Heaven on a Sunday, which is uh, I think would have been a hit. It had been released in the seventies. And one of my favorite McCartney solo songs is the title track. There's a little bit of everything on there. Young boy is the typical kind of cute McCartney pop tune. Uh, and it's 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 amongst the best ones he's done when you're talking about 
those perfect sweet pop tunes that McCartney comes up with. So there's a little of everything happening on Flaming Pie. And as time has passed, what you were pointing out about the production and maybe the stark nature of it, the more stripped back nature of the production is what appeals to me about Flaming Pie. When Tug of War came out, when I guess the same could be said for Pipes of Peace because it was George Martin producing, same with Broad Street, uh, and then Press to Play with Hugh Padgham, my thoughts were, I loved the way those records sounded at the time. But probably upon hearing the Flaming Pies, the Run Devil Runs, the Driving Rains, I became more of a fan of that raw, rawer, rawer as opposed to raw, <laughs> the <laughs> rawer McCartney sound that, you know, we got tastes of on the first album, you know, and some of Ram and whatnot. Mm. Uh, and, you know, that combination of that more back to basics production of Flaming Pie, the fact that there's something for everyone on that album. It's a McCartney sampler of of what he does best, ballads, slow songs, rockers, pop tunes jams half finished songs it's all rolled into a flaming pie and mm. and i'm sure many of us were also riding high still on uh the heels of the beatles anthology the buzz of the albums uh our first serious uh legal <laughs> dive into the beatles uh, into the archives as opposed to bootlegs when i say legal uh the new beatles songs uh, and riding off of that, here is the brand new Paul McCartney album. And I think Paul also uh, was feeding off the energy of the mid-90s and the anthology project. And that comes through in the Flaming Pie album. Just, I think, in ideas, Paul brimming with ideas, brimming with enthusiasm, uh, you know, and a little shot of energy as well. Uh, all coming through on one of his, one of his better records, Flaming Pie. Uh, which has now been expanded and reissued and upgraded and torn apart and rebuilt again in the new collector's edition. Now, can I bounce off a few things that you just said there, Darren? Yeah. One of the things that I've also found fans expressing these days is uh, we're talking about the pure natural McCartney sound here, but they seem to want to drift away from albums where a Beatle has a producer who has an enormous influence on the sound of the album. And I found that not just with McCartney, but with the other Beatles. You know, um, there, there are a number of people who have said to me how they loved Double Fantasy stripped down more so than Double Fantasy as it first came out, you know, because it was a very, well, polished, uh, slick album. I thought it was very well produced. But in the case of Paul, You've got an album like Press to Play, which I dearly love. But for people who don't want to be drenched in the sound of what Hugh Padgham was doing at that time, or a Jeff Lynne production of like a Traveling Wilbury sound, that's, that's one of the things about Flaming Pie is that even though Jeff Lynne is on, you know, half of the album, I think it's eight songs, I don't feel like it's you know, a a strong Jeff Lynne presence, it still sounds like a Paul McCartney album. It definitely does, yeah. Some people have said to me that Cloud Nine has too much Jeff Lynne on it. I don't hear that. I think Traveling Wilburys is certainly more of a heavier Jeff Lynne sound. No, I I hear a lot of Jeff Lynne ELO on Cloud Nine, but it doesn't bother me. Mm -hmm. But uh, to me, I think George, uh, when when he knew that his days were numbered and and Jeff and Danny were going to be the ones to finish up Brainwashed. And I don't know if this is true or not, but I vaguely remember reading something where George told Jeff Lynne not to turn Brainwashed into an Electric Light Orchestra album uh, or something that they were working on together. It was a joke. It was not meant to, to knock Jeff or ELO, but it was kind of funny because to me, Cloud Nine is so ELO-ish, especially if you play... Uh, Cloud Nine up against the last ELO album of the classic era, Balance of Power. You mm-hmm. know, those sound like mid to late 80s Jeff Lynne productions with capital letters. Uh, yeah. And, uh, and, and the Traveling Wilbur stuff does too. But, um, okay, back to the producers. I, I didn't want to cut you, uh, cut you off there. Yeah, but I mean, there are fans out there that feel that 
sometimes the producers have too much of a say to the overall sound. And what you were saying about Brainwashed is true, because George did say that he didn't want his songs to sound very posh. So yeah. that was the word that he used. So it, Jeff Lynne was more restrained on Brainwashed. There's much more right. of a Jeff Lynne sound on Cloud Nine. And yeah, I recognize Jeff Lynne's sound on Cloud Nine. Don't get me wrong. There's a huge difference if you want to go back to the sound of Somewhere in England and Gone Trapo and then go to Cloud Nine. You know that's not a pure George oh, yeah. Harrison production yeah. right there. But I just don't feel like it was overly intrusive what Jeff Lynne did to Cloud Nine. But there are fans now that when I reviewed this album on Talk More Talk, my other podcast show, there are people writing in that love to hear the album without the Jeff Lynne production. So there mm-hmm. is like a kind of a movement these days. There's a trend to want to hear this music stripped down and to hear it more basic, more raw. And that's the way it is as of this moment. Could be different right. 10 years from now. Right. Um, it's, it's why I also, also say, going back to the Beatles, there are some people now who prefer Revolver over Sgt. Pepper, who might look right. at Sgt. Pepper as right. being way too elaborate, way too produced. And Revolver, they were more of just being the band. You know, so it's just um, these trends that happen in the music industry. And mm-hmm. that's, by, of course, the albums there from the Beatles are all great. I'm not saying one is better than the other. They're, it's all strong material there. But I'm just saying in terms of production, I think a lot of people are going in that direction more these days. Mm-hmm. Although Abbey Road uh, seems to be a lot of people's favorites too. So It's funny, the opinion that you just mentioned about people not liking when another producer comes in and really gets their fingerprints all over mm. uh, an album. I never really felt that happened with anything McCartney did. And it never bothered me with Jeff Lynne's fingerprints being, say, all over Cloud Nine. I think what happened, and it happened with me with Mark Hudson working with Ringo, Mm. after a while, the sound started to wear on me. And in 1987, when Cloud Nine came out, Jeff Lynne's sound was fresh and it was not wearing on me. I sort of felt that way, like, by the time the early 90s set in and the Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers album Into the Great Wide Open, uh, I sort of then felt like, Jeff, everything's got to sound like, uh, you know, ELO. Uh, mm-hmm. I, there's some contemporary producers today that I feel that way about. And this has nothing to do with the Beatles. I started feeling that way about a guy who I, uh, I still hold in high regard, T-Bone Burnett. Um, mm-hmm. And I felt like he started to become the flavor of the month as a producer maybe, I don't know, 10 years ago, 5 to 10, 15 years ago. And it was starting to beat in my ears. Everything that T-Bone Burnett produced sounded the same. The drums were muddy. They sounded like they were actually playing, the drummers were playing wet pillows. You know, there was a certain sound that T-Bone Burnett was adding to everything. And for me, the straw that broke the camel's back was the Elton John Leon Russell album, which was so too T-Bone Burnettish. And even more contemporary today, and then I'll move back to Flaming Pie, is Dan Auerbach of the Black Keys. And it seems like everything Dan Auerbach produces ends up sounding like, here's, here's so-and-so who's now joined the Black Keys. This is the new Black Keys album. Yeah, so, but I never felt that happened, at least not with McCartney, uh, except perhaps maybe Chaos and Creation in the Backyard, because you know that Nigel Godrich is a different beast in a, you know, uh, of a producer. And that doesn't sound like anything that I know of that Nigel Godrich produced. It's not the typical McCartney album, yet he was brilliant in really bringing out McCartney uh, at his best from beginning to end. Um, it, yeah, it certainly had a very early McCartney sound, solo McCartney yeah. sound. Yeah. But anyway, uh, back to Flaming Pie, you know, Lots of sampling of a lot of things going on, the stripped down thing. We're pretty much on the same page when it comes to our personal views of of where Flaming Pie ranks, what it sounds like in comparison to other albums and whatnot. But as for this box set, which is now out, like all of the box sets that are coming out these days, and this has been the case with pretty much every one of the McCartney Archive collection sets, there's multiple configurations that you could buy. And... Uh, I went for the big kahuna 
uh, the six hundred dollar collector's edition. Wait a minute. Just want to make sure my wife's not around and she doesn't hear that it was six hundred dollars. I'm kidding. Um, but yeah, that's and, and if I'm not mistaken, the only place to get it was from McCartney's website, and it was six hundred dollars. Take it or leave it. I could be wrong. I don't know if there were any other uh, outlets selling the big mega collector's edition, which is pretty big. It came. Uh, my copy was not delivered on the day of release, July thirty first. Uh, it was released about four. Uh, I got it in the mail about four days later. And when it arrived, it came. Uh, actually, it came on the day that the tropical storm hit the northeast and knocked my power out for four and a half days. Ugh. So I had a jugunda box in my living room that I really didn't want to open until I could be comfortable and have lighting. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I could even listen to it because, you know, couldn't listen to anything. So I went for the biggie. And the biggie, the collector's edition, five CDs two DVDs and a grand total of four LPs in there with books and art prints and all kinds of other paraphernalia. If you've got a bad back, you'll need someone to help you lift it and take it down to where you want to uh, dig into it. Uh, then the next below that was the deluxe edition, uh, which I think is the one you got, Ken. That's it. Five yeah. CDs and two DVDs. Uh, and then under that, if I have this all right, and I hope I do, there's the three LP edition. There's a two LP edition, uh, a two CD edition. And of course, the digital, the streaming component or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, so so that's the all of them. And I uh, went for the biggie, the collector's edition. I'm glad I did. There is a lot, though, in there to sink your teeth into. And I am still digging through, especially the books and the art prints and uh, all of the other goodies that come inside uh, the collector's edition. I don't know if the collector's edition is still available, but I think, McC uh, yeah, here it, I have it here on McCartney's website. The one you have, the deluxe edition, the mm -hmm. second tier, is sold out on McCartney's website. I don't know if that's permanent or not, but it's sold out on McCartney's site. I should try to check to see if the collector's edition is... Uh, is still available of the $600 one. But in any event, the collector's edition, the biggie gives you uh, all the extras like the magazines, a reprint of club sandwich at that time, a reprint of the flame magazine. And you get the, the, the uh, ballad of the skeletons on vinyl, uh, a one sided 12 inch single where the other side is etched. Very cool to collect. Perhaps, that's, the, that's the super deluxe you're talking about. Yeah. That's the collect, what they refer to as the yeah. collector edition. Mm -hmm. That's the one I have. Perhaps some will think that's a bit of overkill, things like that, etched, you know, LPs and, you know, three different books when everything could have probably been com combined into one hardcover coffee table book. That's what the collector's edition is all about. And uh, the deluxe edition is what Ken has. And then there's the smaller ones. But as I mentioned, the deluxe edition at this point in time while we're recording, uh, is sold out on McCartney's uh, website. The collector's edition still looks like it's available, uh, the $600 one. So there's still time for you to get it, Ken. Just don't tell your wife. <laughs> I have no interest in it whatsoever. You know, I've said many times on my shows that as long as I have all the audio and all the video, that's all that matters to me. And it's right. not that everything else in the package doesn't matter because I happen to love the books that have come out through the years with all the Linda McCartney photos. I devour those. And I think the one that was done for this box set is really very, very strong. And I also love when he has all the handwritten lyrics that he includes. I devour right. that stuff. I love it. But I'd be very happy if all I had was a box set of CDs and DVDs in a small box the size of a CD box. You know, right. if that's that's what matters the most to me every time I buy any of this stuff. So. I like the fact that McCartney has always made it available to buy his archival stuff in a variety of ways, depending upon how much money you want to spend and what's really important to you. And there are plenty of people out there that buy some of this stuff as collectors, and they, can, they care more about the collectability of it than they care about the music. I'm not like that. There's a lot of people I know that will buy this stuff, keep it sealed, never open it, and then they intend on selling it many years down the road to make more money. That's not me. The reason I became a fan all these years is all because of the art. It's all because of the music and the video. 
So the CDs and the DVDs matter the most to me. But I do like the other stuff as well. And I don't have to have the etched 12-inch of the Ballad of the Skeletons. And there's also supposed to be some uh, silk screen thing that Linda McCartney was involved with. Or, yes. Which uh, I haven't I have seen written... at this point. So yeah, this, is, this is the part that even though I have the set, uh, I really haven't had the opportunity to spend time with all of the non-musical stuff in the collector's mm -hmm. edition. But the, uh, I think you're referring to, uh, yeah, there's a marbled art folder featuring six Linda McCartney prints, a 128-page book, facsimiles of the handwritten lyrics, uh, which uh, come in in uh, like a second like interop, in like a manila envelope, right. uh, the same newspaper, the reprint of Club Sandwich, and then a separate book, which is John Hamill's studio notebook, a reproduction of it with his studio notes. Some of this stuff, I look at it and go, you know, you probably could have saved a few bucks in manufacturing if you made everything one big book, and each book, each each little part would be a chapter in this one big book. And I don't need the individual handwritten lyrics and posters and stuff like that to confuse me and get misplaced. But listen, hey, I bought it. I'm not complaining. I sound like I am. I'd rather have it than not. And uh, I'm. It's going to give me uh, much entertainment in this age of quarantines uh, for months to come. This box set. I will say though that as someone who really loves handwritten lyrics, and in fact, one of my favorite things in going to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, which I did a couple of times when they had a John Lennon exhibit, they had a whole floor there of just handwritten lyrics of John's, every one of them framed, and I would just stare at it all mm -hmm. day long. I love that stuff, and I love the fact that several years ago, Paul started doing that in his box sets. I love the fact that he even saved the handwritten lyrics. Just like these demos, we take it for granted that he saved this stuff. I love the fact that he still has this, and in some cases, it's on the same colored paper that he used. But the thing is, you know, after this box set has been released and I'm and I'm examining it and going through it, how often do I do I go back to that stuff? I would much rather, if I had the time and the money, I'd like to take some of these handwritten lyrics and try to frame them. Yeah. I'd love to have that on, on my wall instead of encased in this box set. But mm -hmm. I love the fact that he does that. And and yeah, I do too. I'm not as big. I'm I'm not as big on reprints, reproductions of of lyrics and and things like that. But you bring out a good point when it comes to uh, being able to put them on the wall, for example, as opposed to, you know, stray pieces of paper in an envelope that comes in a box set. I just think it, I would enjoy these things, like I said, much better if they were put compiled into a single book that you could look from beginning to end, spend time with and not have to, you know, go through one book and then put that away, get the other book to look at these art prints, put that away, get me the manila envelope. Uh, I want to look at these. You're going to frame them all? Yeah, one day. Uh, but you put them away and you forget they're in there. And when all is said and done, of course, the most important thing is the music that's on the discs and the content of the DVDs and whatnot. And there's plenty of that on Flaming Pie. And we probably should spend a little bit of time poking around on the audio of the box mm -hmm. set. And uh, in, in some regards... I felt like there's a and when you look at it you, before you sink your teeth in and start listening to the discs, you go, wow, there's five CDs here. There's two DVDs and the collector's edition, of course, redundantly is that a word redundantly. Yes, I think so. Uh, the collector's edition redundantly adds the four LPs in there. So you get CD and LP. Yeah, I bought these sets many times where they give you both and often think to myself, do I really need it on vinyl? Do I really need it on CD if I've got the other? But I buy them anyway. But yeah, five CDs, two DVDs of content. There's a lot there. But one thing, and I don't mean to, you know, kind of criticize that I felt a little bit was there is a lot of audio redundancy, different demos or home recordings of, of the same song that after a while you begin to, I found myself getting glazed over. Oh, what version of Beautiful Night is this? So this is the run through. It's not the demo from 1995. Or, mm -hmm. you know, here's uh, Calico Skies in the studio as opposed to the uh, home recording, which 
isn't referred to as a demo, but sure sounds like a demo to me. That I felt was a little overkill. But again, like I've often said, I'd rather have it than not. But and some of the studio chatter that pops up in the studio sessions is fun. But some of the, you know, demos and 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 uh, and home recordings gets a little tedious at times, in my opinion, going mm-hmm. through all of it. I don't know if you agree with that. Well, in this particular case, I love those two CDs of demos and, and uh, studio recordings. And at times, I mean, to me, uh, demo and, and home recording, you could pretty much say are the same thing. I don't know how you differentiate in some of these uh, releases what what the difference really is. A demo could be in the studio, too, but it's the earliest versions of these songs. But um, in some cases, between these two discs, there aren't too many differences between both versions of the same right. song but you do notice what we call the evolution of a song and that fascinates me very much i will say you know and i i can't predict how i'm going to play this music five years from now or 10 years from now i found that with a lot of mccartney's stuff there's only a few of them that i go back to on a regular basis for bonus material maybe different mm-hmm in the future but i uh, in particular i mean the the flowers and the dirt stuff the demos of the paul and elvis stuff paul and elvis together and those same songs by the band i go back to that a lot i may not go back to other stuff from his other box sets but that could change i know that i just like having this at my access i like knowing that I've got one of the earliest versions or possibly the earliest versions of these songs and what they sounded like back then. And when you're talking about these early versions, you've got three different types of ways to look at them. There are songs that have sections there that are written that Paul later took out. There are songs that are missing sections of the song that he had to develop more. And then what I find just as fascinating are songs where from the very beginning, the whole arrangement was all finished anyway. Mm -hmm. There isn't that big a difference between Little Willow when he starts doing it and the finished product, other than a little bit more production uh, on the album. And the same thing, I mean, uh, Some Days is a stunning, exquisite song, one of his greatest love songs to me. And I love what George Martin brought to it. But by itself on acoustic guitar it's just amazing as a song mm-hmm. it works just like that so yeah. paul's part in the song how he plays it on acoustic guitar that's all worked out same thing with little willow same thing with calico skies you know those songs they were already formed from the very beginning and there was little more to be done i shouldn't say that about about some days because you know george martin what he brought to it with the orchestration was beyond perfect as far as i'm concerned so i find all that stuff happening it's the same thing with the beatles you know i've said before if you listen to the take of come together on the beatles anthology or the one that's on the abbey road box set it's pretty darn close to what the finished product was going to be so that tells you that early on they kind of knew what they wanted so i find that to be very fascinating at the same time if you go to the home recordings here Uh, the first disc of bonus material, you'll find that the song we were singing, there were extra sections in the song that he took out. And it was fascinating to hear that because the guy like McCartney has so many ideas, he doesn't know what to do with them. (laughs) And very often he'll take something from one song, take it out of the song, and maybe he'll use it for another song in the future. You never know. There's a lot of songs that McCartney's done throughout the years that are made up of separate sections or or songs that he strings together like you know the pound is sinking is one of those songs so uh you know band on the run in in many ways is like that so you never know if any of these ideas might crop up in another song later but he knew enough that it was smart to take these two sections out of the song we were singing and i still liked it the way that it was here in its earliest version right you know, a song like young boy starts off being poor boy and Paul did say that he changed it because he knew there was an Elvis Presley song called Poor Boy. So he changed it to Young Boy. Then you also, uh, I think in the, the handwritten lyrics, I think the song was called Find Love. So 
you know, they could change the song titles around. That's another thing that you discover. This is part of the, right. the whole process of writing songs. In the world tonight, uh, the song in the world tonight, he switches the words around. Instead of, I can see the world tonight, look into the future, it, st it starts with, I can see the future. <laughs> you know, at some point, he flip-flops the lyrics. So it's fascinating to hear that. And even a song like The World Tonight, which I would never say is an overproduced song, the, the finished version, it's stripped down even more. It's more acoustic-focused in these early versions, especially the one on the second disc. And it has a different vibe and a different feel to it. And I love that aspect of it. The lyrics were not finished on The World Tonight for these versions, these earlier versions. So I like hearing them in their earlier forms. Souvenir is another song where uh, on this first disc, um, it's missing the middle section. The part where Paul sings, well, I can hold you too tight. That part's missing. So at some point, he has to develop that. So you get all these changes. If you want to. That first disc, it's a much faster version than the one that came out on the album. So at some point, he had to slow it down, which he does by the second disc. So you learn these things. It's, um, but also, as we pointed out in my other podcast, you could fit everything from these two discs onto one disc. Mm, yeah, but because point. you know they were recorded at separate times, so that's probably why they were kept separate. Mm -hmm. Good point. Good point about that. Uh, just a brief recap, disc one of the uh, of the multi-disc sets is the original album remastered. Then uh, you come to the, in the collector's edition and deluxe editions, uh, you get what is referred to as home recordings on CD2. CD3 has a lot of demos in, in the studio tracks. And again, the lines that separate those versions on those two CDs is, isn't very well defined. Because you'll they'll be mixed together demos and home recordings and whatnot. Some of the home recordings, the re, the quality of the recording is isn't great. Uh, so it's more like looking at a sketch uh, in its early stages. For example, the world tonight I thought was a poor recording. Calico skies, the same thing. I think it's comical and souvenir. I was listening with headphones. His phone started to ring. Yep. <laughs> uh, during souvenir and uh, it, it uh, just completely startled me and i thought it was comical going and, and i was like oh getting off on the fact that's what paul mccartney's phone sounded like when it rang in in the mid 90s mm. or the conversation that's going on in the background of the home recording of great day i'm trying to figure out who is talking is it the kids kind of off mic having a conversation while dad's running through another song some of the studio stuff that's on cd3 the chatter is interesting I love hearing Linda there, and we know that Linda was really not going to be with us all that much longer. But Linda's there, and you hear her at Paul's side, you know, Ringo and Paul discussing a few things before they went, uh, did a run-through of Beautiful Night. One track that I kind of forgot all about is uh, on, towards the end of CD3, is Whole Life. Uh-huh. And I sort of forgot about that track existing. Uh, so when it popped up, I went scrambling to try to figure out what is whole life. I, I don't remember this. And well, uh, yeah. you get some light on that one, Ken. Well, that was a song that first came out in 2003, I think the year was. And um, it was released on an EP. It was a digital EP. And it was uh, sort of to celebrate that Nelson Mandela had been freed from prison. And right. The, the EP was called 46664, which right. was the number that was on his uniform. And the EP had four songs on it. I know Queen was on there. Uh, I forget the others, but Whole Life was on it. And it was right. a song that Paul had written with Dave Stewart of the Arrhythmics. But even though, you know, I have the information here in, uh, in my Eight Arms to Hold You book, um, I completely forgot about the fact that it was an older song that was worked on around this time. And Whole Life, when it first came out, the version on that EP, was Paul with his new band at the time. Right. right. This version here was really just Paul and Dave Stewart. And uh, it's a little bit different because there are sections in there that he took out in the, the version from 2003. It's a little bit slower. It's very edgy. 
that 2003 version is is a killer it's a great rock song with a great guitar riff very similar to like the world tonight <laughs> you know but uh it's nice to have these two different versions and that earlier version of whole life on here is one of the definite highlights of this collection oh, oh yeah and it, 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 it's funny it made me realize how as we've all gotten older i mean i feel this way about my own head uh my memory isn't as good as it used to be and is very scrambled at times there was a time when i was able to dissect the non-album tracks, collect them all, know where they were. And at some point, probably when the CD started to hit around the time of Press to Play, when you'd get multiple B-sides and you'd get cassette single B-sides and CD single B-sides and a different vinyl single in the UK, it started to blow my mind. And uh, somehow, whole life, either I missed it or completely forgot about it. So, yeah, as you pointed out, the version that's on the Flaming Pie box was a rough mix. And then they, uh, Paul did it with his current band and Dave Stewart and released it on that uh, Nelson Mandela uh, tribute disc. Um, so that's cool to have. And I agree with you, Ken. Whole Life is one of the highlights on the well, entire you, set. You know, the, the 2003 version was never a part of anything. It was just a separate release. But right, all, throughout right. Paul's, all throughout Paul's career... You know, there have been these side projects of songs that go out there, of collaborations with different people. And unless, you know, this is like uh, pre-internet time, unless you picked up Beatles Monthly magazine or Beatle fan or any of those great sources of information, Steve Marinucci's Abbey Road website at the time, you wouldn't know some of these things came out. Right. You know, so I always remember it was many years later that I even knew that Paul made a duet with George Michael, Heal the Pain. Unless you knew about it when it was happening and it was publicized in any way, you know, you'd never know it. So yeah. um, there's, there's a whole life out there. Oh, pardon the pun. I wasn't planning that. There's a whole <laughs> life of all these side projects of Paul and the other Beatles that a lot of fans don't even know about, of things that were all one-offs working with different people. And uh, Whole Life was one of them. But it's really cool that they put this early version in there. I mean, when we find out that these box sets come out, those of us who studied the catalog are already anticipating what might be on it. I never thought Whole Life, this early version, would be on there. That completely took me by surprise. Hmm. As did the Ballad okay. of the Skeletons as well. So That's an interesting one because that's one that didn't slip past me. I remember, um, and I'm trying, now I can't, I can't even remember where I would find out about all of these releases, but I think it was probably a combination of Beatle Fan magazine, and also, do you remember uh, a magazine called ICE, I-C-E, uh, which initially stood for International CD Exchange, I think. It was mm. a CD magazine that kept you up to date on releases, special editions, box sets, reissues, and whatnot, and that yeah. was a Bible. and. Yeah. I think it was in Ice that I found out about the Ballad of the Skeletons. And I, and I have, I think, a few copies of it on CD and always liked it and thought it was the coolest thing in the world. And McCartney was collaborating with Allen Ginsberg and Philip Glass and Lenny Kay. And yet, despite the fact that I really dug the tune, I sort of forgot about it over the years. And when Flaming Pie was announced and it was mentioned that it was included within uh, the collector's edition and the deluxe edition, I jumped and I was like, hey, I totally forgot about that. And it's going to be great to have that resurrected. Mm -hmm. No pun intended with skeletons. <laughs> um, and then uh, uh, jumping ahead to now the fourth disc, which continues on with these stray tracks from a variety of sources. We get the four songs, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, four non-album track single B-sides that were released. Um, there's Looking For You and Broomstick, mm -hmm. which were both part of the Young Boy singles. So I'll say singles because vinyl, CD, cassette singles, England, America, whatnot. But Looking For You and Broomstick were on the Young Boy single, plural. And uh, Love Come Tumbling Down and Same Love were part of the Beautiful Night single, if I've got that straight. Uh, and they're all four tracks uh, present on uh, CD4 of the uh, box set. There, there came a time when 
these singles came out and I just cared about getting whichever version had the most music. So the CD singles, which had the B side, if you want to call it the B side and bonus tracks like the Ubu Jubu stuff that's on this box set. That's what I bought. I never right. really thought to myself, looking for you is the B-side of The World Tonight or whatever. I just bought right. all these CD singles. So that's how right. I look at them, really. And that's what's on that, that fourth disc. But right. um, what did you think of it, Darren? Um, I have not listened to the Ubu Jubu tracks. That mm. I haven't done. I remember hearing them back in the day, but it's so many years now. And I did uh, listen to a couple of them when they started to release the advanced digital singles after announcing the box set. But I always felt that those four songs, Looking For You, Broomstick, Love Come Tumbling Down, and Same Love, were four very strong non-album tracks that uh, would have fitted very nicely on Flaming Pie. I listened to them once since the box set came out, so I I really can't uh, single out which ones I like more than the others. But again, it was a very fertile period for Paul, and even the things that were kind of straight tracks were uh, of, of, of high quality. Hmm. I don't know if I would necessarily, uh, I shouldn't say this, but in terms of his pop music, a fertile period, because we have to talk about the In the World Tonight DVD a little bit later on. But when you consider the fact that beyond the actual album for Flaming Pie, uh, some of these songs were really older songs. Uh, okay. Same Love dates back to 1988. Love Come Tumbling Down was part of an entire album of songs that Paul worked on with Phil Ramone in 1987. Many of the songs that are in the Ubu Jubu series are part of those Phil Ramone sessions. So, you know, just in terms of the actual songs that he was working on, the pop songs of that time, and you also got to consider the fact that within the album Flaming Pie, uh, Calico Skies, and Great Day were both recorded in 1992 anyway. <laughs> so he just had to add those two songs to the newer songs. You got Looking For You, which to me is very similar in style to Really Love You. Has a very spontaneous feel right there with Ringo playing drums on it. So, and then, like I said, the Ubu Jubu stuff, it's, it's older material. And, um, but... I like the fact that Ubu Jubu, which I feel is a very important part of Paul's solo career, he had his own radio series called Ubu Jubu. I seem to recall reading that there were 17 episodes. The book that comes with Flaming Pie says there were 15. But that entire series, uh, Paul had complete freedom to put whatever music he wanted to in the show and most of it was his own songs some of it were favorite songs of his from the past that might have influenced him and i wish that there would be a box set to come out of all those episodes instead of releasing these bonus tracks of ubu jubu as they appeared on the cd singles originally you know in a right. way uh, i enjoyed listening to it this time around but i want to hear those songs in the clear Songs like Atlantic yes. Ocean and Love Mix. Yeah. I don't want to hear them as part of a radio broadcast. Right. I love radio, as you know. <laughs> we, our entire career has been radio. But I think, you know, it's kind of like if I wanted to hear all the songs from the Lost Lennon tapes, I'd want to hear the songs. I wouldn't want to listen to each show, you know, over and over and over again with the host and with everything else that goes all around it. I like just the songs by themselves. In the book that comes of Flaming Pie, it's interesting because Paul did address this issue about making those bonus tracks. He said he was kind of bored with the format of, I guess, you know, you, you call these EPs, whatever you want to call them, CD singles. Go back to the Beatles. You've got, you know, four song EPs back then. I love that whole format of stuff that's not on the album. Same thing as B-sides to 45s. So he wanted to shake things up a little bit. So it was kind of cool at that time for him to, you know, put these segments of his radio series in there. And he actually scaled it down and edited it from the original CD singles. Okay. Because sometimes you'd have things like Linda's the cooking recipe for something. And that's all great. But I love the fact that he did all that stuff, you know, as its own thing as a radio series. I don't. I don't see it as something that I would want to repeat over and over again to get to hear Atlantic Ocean or whatever the song is. 
you know, or the earlier version of Beautiful Night. I'd want to hear those songs by themselves. So, you know, I appreciate the fact that he had a radio series at that time. And I hope that at some point, you know, he's into collectibles, as we all know. He could put out a box set of Ubu Jubu and, uh, you know, just make it 3,000 copies. And that's it. And it goes out there. Um, although there's probably a lot of issues he has to deal with with clearance of other songs that are not his own. Or is, or, or just lop off the, the, the tracks like you were saying and give them to us un, undoctored, un, you know, where they're not part of the radio program. Uh, that, was a, that was something that bugged me about disc one of the Beatles Anthology One album was that uh, George Martin sort of uh, those early tracks uh, those very rare tracks instead of just giving to them giving us remastered top quality it was almost like that beginning of the first anthology album was almost turned into like it was a radio program with segues and spoken word introductions and interview snippets and 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 that actually kind of cheesed me off back then yeah there was that intro that went into searching from the death yeah, of, you know that no, no, you know no, no. i want to hear the whole song <laughs> right know? Right. Um, you alluded to the documentary footage, the DVD footage, which comes on further discs down uh, deeper in the box set. I will. Um, I, I'm guilty. I have not had the opportunity to dig into those. One thing, though, I'm thrilled and I can't wait to watch and might be the first thing I watch is the In the World Tonight documentary, which I loved when that came out. And all the other goodies that's included on that disc, the EPKs and uh, other things which I haven't seen yet, that's uh, in itself looks like it's a treasure trove. Mm. Okay. Well, I can tell you, first of all, in the world tonight, I loved, I, I dearly yeah. love that documentary. I don't know what it is. I, I can't explain this about me, but I know that through the years, the music, the Beatles and the solo music never leaves me. I'm always going back to some of it or all of it, really. But the video stuff, I don't really watch as much. And when, like, Flowers in the Dirt came out, the box set, I was so happy that Put It There was part of it. But I hadn't right. watched it probably since, for, since it first came out. I have the video cassette for that. Same thing with In the World Tonight. But I will tell you this. I'm going to watch In the World Tonight frequently because I think it was so well done as a documentary. It's not so much just about Flaming Pie. It's about... <laughs> everything that Paul McCartney was doing at that time in 1997. It covers the fact that he was painting, you know, and his paintings would result into a book a few years later. It also covers the fact that he was knighted around that time. It talks about Standing Stone, his latest classical work that he was working on. Uh, it brings up Tropic Island Hum, which is, you know, another really great animated short that Paul was working on, following Rupert and the Bear that animated short. Um, right. I love the fact that this is, I don't know, this is a minor thing, I suppose, with me, even though he never said a word in the entire documentary. You see Jeff Emmerich quite a lot <laughs> in this documentary. He's there at the recording console. Sometimes he's standing up in front of the console, just knowing that he was there. Jeff Emmerich was, you know, pretty much a mainstay in, in Paul McCartney's solo career. He worked on a lot of Paul's albums. Um, you do see George Martin at the end. Uh, I loved uh, the whole bit about Beautiful Night, the way that was covered in this documentary, uh, how they would go back and forth between showing Paul and Ringo isolated in the studio and then Paul and Jeff Lynn on acoustic guitars for their parts. That was all very well done. But um, just the fact that you got to see the many sides of Paul McCartney and how busy he was at that time with so many different projects. Mm -hmm. It's just astounding. It's not just the Flaming Pie album and, and on to the next album. He's doing so many different things all at the same time. And I found that uh, really well done. Uh, so you're yeah. hearing that it makes me feel terrible that I can't even, you know, enjoy a box set and have dinner at the same time. Uh, <laughs> it, this is too confusing and, and hard. But yeah, I haven't had the opportunity. And again, as I mentioned at the top, you know, at the top of our discussion about the box set, what what really did me in was losing power and after the tropical storm and lost four or five days where really I didn't even look at the package. It was just in the living room off to the side. 
but there's a lot of really good stuff on these DVDs in here. And I know in the past there have been complaints that maybe the video uh, part of these collections uh, maybe were too thin or could have had a little more included. You get to, It looks like you get a nice sampling of that period in McCartney's career on uh, these DVDs here in Flaming Pie. You do, but at the same time, if, if you study everything that the man has done, you also notice what's not on here. But, um, well, that's like, the, for example, well, that's you know. The next box set. <laughs> that's like, the Flaming Pie Volume 2 box set coming in 20 years. Uh, I, I will say that one of the things I was hoping all along would be on here would be the town hall meeting with John Fugel saying, which I thought was a great special at the time. Um, right. And part of that is in the documentary for In the World Tonight. So at least that's addressed. But also at the same time, he was on Oprah Winfrey show. There's nothing from that. What else? He was on Conan O'Brien. He was interviewed by Conan uh, at that time. Nothing from that. You know, but still, there's quite a lot here to appreciate. The second right. disc, that other DVD, is great because it does have all the videos for Young Boy and The World Tonight and Beautiful Night and Little Willow. It has interviews with Paul in the electronic press kit. Lots of them also as individual segments. But the, the problem that I have sometimes with, and you were even saying this earlier, Darren, uh, what's in the, the DVDs and even uh, transferring over to the CD, um, because there's a whole CD of Paul in the studio and introducing various instruments that he used, and a lot of them have historical importance. But a lot of that stuff is repetitious. And you get the right. same quotes over and over again. Um, a lot of that is really kind of geared towards people in the media. So they have clips to play to go into songs. I don't know if that's necessarily what works best for, you know, just the general fans out there. But right. um, what I found fascinating about that second DVD is that you get to see Paul make suggestions to the orchestra uh, on Beautiful Night. And there's even an, an entire... Uh, segment in there and they talk about that in the book that accompanies the box set about the whole packaging and the art design of the album and he, and Paul and Linda are sitting down with the guy who's going to work on that with them and Paul has all these ideas and he's bringing them out and it tells you how he's so hands on on every aspect of his work and so I find that really fascinating that he has ideas for everything he doesn't just say here you take care of this you know He's an idea man, that Paul McCartney. <laughs> well, Ken and I could go on and on for another hour or two or three, as uh, as we've been known to do about uh, Flaming Pie. But uh, this is one of the better box sets. In a nutshell, I, I feel it's one of the better uh, collections in this ongoing uh, archive collection uh, series. I want to make a very quick mention in passing. I haven't. I, they arrived in the mail last night. There is a book, a companion book, that was published by Super Deluxe Edition website slash e-magazine, if that's what it actually is. But uh, And they did a nice uh, a kind of a, a booklet on the anthology, the archive collection up to this point. So that's out there. You, you know, Google Super Deluxe Edition, Paul McCartney Archive Collection. I'm sure you'll track it down. My books came, uh, I ordered two of them, came late last night, so... I just quickly looked at the pretty pictures and went to bed. But uh, so just so that you know that that's out there. It's it's now a good time, considering the fact that these archive box sets have been coming out for it's 10 years now, to look back on all these box sets and talk about your favorites. We should talk about why they are. And, and even if um, what you would change with any of these box sets, if these aren't the final versions to come out. <laughs> Who knows when McCartney's uh, catalog gets finished, if maybe there'll be more reissues after that and how that gets handled. I never think there's any finality to anything with this music. So, Just when you think you've got the, heard the last of it, there's mm. more. Yes. <laughs> so I guess that puts a wrap on uh, the Paul McCartney Archive Collection edition of Flaming Pie here on Things We Said Today. Darren DeVivo here with Ken Michaels, Alan Cozen taking a bit of a break as he works on volume one of his McCartney book uh, with his deadlines coming up. Uh, he's taking uh, a bit of a breather from this show, but he'll be back. 
And on the next things we said today in a couple of weeks, give or take, uh, we will have a couple of special guests. We'll have the Two Legs podcast joining us. Tom Hunyadi and Andy Nichols uh, will be joining us. So we'll have four legs uh, <laughs> of things that we need to say. Uh, what? On the next show. So that's going to be coming up in two weeks. Uh, Darren Ken and things we said today joined by Tom and Andy of Two Legs. And then the next show after that, we'll reverse the concept. It'll be Two Legs with Darren and Ken as the special guests. Uh, so that's going to be our next two shows. And we've got some cool special guests and folks we'd like to interview on future shows. So be sure to keep an eye out for things we said today. So, Ken, give us your contact information and how so people can reach out to you. You can always email me at everylittlething at att.net. You can check out my website, which is kenmichaelsradio.com. Loads of interviews all throughout the website with various people in the Beatle world and lots of Beatle authors and Beatles trivia every single week where you can win one of 10 prizes now. It's just pretty amazing, the prizes to pick from. You should all check that out if you can. Uh, don't forget that... Um, Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast. That's my other podcast show, which has Tom Hunyadi in it, uh, as every other Monday night. The next show will be this coming Monday, which is the 24th of August at 9 p.m. Eastern. And we'll be joined by someone you know and love, Al Sussman, former co-host of this show. And uh, Al just wrote a piece in Beatle Fan Magazine on the 50-year career, post-Beatles career of Paul McCartney. And we'll be talking about his article and what he thinks of Paul's work all these many years. And that'll be in the next show. And if you want to catch my show, Every Little Thing, the syndicated show, there's a page on my website which lists all the radio stations and all the times that they run the show with links to their websites so you can stream them. So that's all at KenMichaelsRadio.com. And that's about it. All right. And if you want to reach out to me, you can email me at WFUV, Darren DeVivo at WFUV.org, org. And the name is D A R R E N D E V I V O. Uh, go to Facebook. I'm always on Facebook. Uh, they're going to rename it Darren Book soon. Uh, <laughs> you can go to Darren DeVivo, like, uh, friend me there. Also, go to my other page, which is Darren DeVivo, WFUV DJ. Beatles podcaster, writer, and you can click like on that one. Sometimes there's different content. I'm still trying to figure out how to manage uh, those two pages and both, uh, you know, put uh, stuff up there and cut down on the redundancy. So look for both of those and, uh, and email me if you'd like. And if you want to listen to me on WFUV, uh, you can tune in in the New York City metropolitan area at 90.7 FM. If you're an HD head, we have 90.7 FM HD2. You can stream us anywhere in the world at WFUV.org. Uh, download the app. Listen on the WFUV app. Uh, and uh, you can even ask your smart speaker to play WFUV. And I'm on Monday through Thursday nights at the moment, just 10 p.m. to midnight. Normally, pre-pandemic, I was on till 2 a.m. Uh, but for the time being, it's 10 p.m. to midnight, Monday through Thursday nights. And on Saturdays uh, at the moment, again, as a result of the pandemic, I'm on the air from 1 to 4 Saturday afternoons. And uh, that's my story at WFUV. Remember, our next things we said today will be Ken and I, uh, Alan, taking a break. And our guests will be Two Legs, Tom Hunyadi and Andy Nichols. So for Ken Michaels and, well, Alan in spirit, thank you so much for listening. Uh, enjoy Flaming Pie, and we'll see you on the next things we said today. Mm -hmm.